Hello, Four Lakes family. I hope you're all doing well. We are here together tonight to study from the book of Acts, and so we are making our way through Acts. We are partway through chapter 20, so I hope you have a copy of the Bible. You can turn with me to Acts chapter 20. We'll be there in just a moment. We're partway through this chapter. We hope to finish it tonight. Uh, I hope to see you for worship this coming Sunday, either at 9 or 11. So we still have the two worship services with the Bible class in between at 10 as we're working our way through Second Peter. I've enjoyed uh, being in those classes and hearing the interaction between all of you in the class. That's been a highlight of my Lord's Day every week for a number of weeks now. So I'm thankful for that good opportunity, that good class that's continuing, and then worship at 9 or 11. And if you can sign up for one of those two services online, on the Sign Up Genius account, we would deeply appreciate that. And if you're a guest with us tonight, if you can hear me now and you're not a member, your name isn't in the directory and all that, uh, feel free to just show up. Guests are always welcome. We would just love to see you this coming Sunday at 9 or 11. Tonight we are continuing, as I said, in our study of the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, and specifically it's focusing in on the Acts of Peter and Paul. So Peter in the first third of the book, Paul in the final two thirds, and we are well into the ministry of Paul at this point. The book was written by Luke, the beloved physician, and Luke was writing to a man by the name of Theophilus and giving him just a history of the early church. Uh, tonight we are partway through Acts chapter 20, but by very, way of very brief review, we want to just update the ABCs of Acts. So if you're joining us, you'll know uh, something of what this is about. So we have basically a, a one or two, maybe three word summary of uh, each of the chapters going along with the alphabet. So chapter one, which is A, would be the ascension. Then chapter two, the beginning of the church. Uh, chapter three, carried and cured. Chapter four, the determined disciples who wouldn't stop preaching. In chapter five, we had the empty jail. Uh, the first deacons with a question mark in chapter 6. Great hero was Stephen in chapter 7. In Acts 8, we had the Ethiopian eunuch or the Ethiopian officer asking, how can I? In Acts 9, I am Jesus. In chapter 10, the journey to Joppa. In chapter 11, we had the reminder that the kingdom now includes Gentiles. In chapter 12, we had Peter liberated again. He's been let out of prison a number of times in the book of Acts. In Acts 13, we had missionaries sent out. So the first missionary journey was sent out there in Acts chapter 13, the first few verses. In chapter 14, Paul and Barnabas had to convince the crowds that they were not gods but men. In chapter 15, we had the reminder that the old law is not binding. In chapter 16, the Philippian jailer converted. In chapter 17, questions answered in Athens with Paul preaching on the Areopagus there. In chapter 18, we had reasoning with a preacher as Priscilla and Aquila pull Apollos aside privately to explain to him the way of God more accurately. In chapter 19, we had saving our religious friends. So Paul uh, questions and then rebaptizes those 12 men in Ephesus who had been baptized improperly the first time. So they thought they were saved, but they were not. And so saving our religious friends. Well, tonight we continue in Acts 20 with the summary of what we studied last week, Troas on the Lord's Day. So we are continuing after that. Troas was last week in the first few verses of chapter 20. <clears throat> Excuse me, but we're picking up uh, partway through chapter 20. By way of brief review, we are on Paul's third missionary journey. At this point, he's basically on his way back to Jerusalem. So he's gone through Ephesus, Troas, Philippi. Macedonia down to Athens and Corinth and then back around and so he's making his way almost all the way back around but not quite all the way. Uh, in tonight's section I'll zoom in there he's already made that loop as I said through Macedonia and Greece. Uh, last week is when he passed through Troas the second time on his way back to Jerusalem and tonight he stops on the beach in Miletus and he calls for the elders of the church in Ephesus. So if you remember uh, Paul is in a hurry to get some famine relief back to Jerusalem, to the saints who were having a hard time. And uh, this was important not only for uh, their physical relief, but it would also, I think, bring some unity between the new Gentile congregations over in uh, Macedonia and uh, Greece. And so Paul was collecting funds from primarily Gentile congregations and bringing this money back to Jerusalem. Uh, to help as they were suffering through this famine. So Paul's in a hurry. He's booking it back to Jerusalem, uh, but he does want to encourage the elders from Ephesus, but he doesn't want to go all the way to Ephesus. That's uh, maybe, I don't know, 60 miles or so inland, if I remember correctly. I could be wrong on that, but uh, it was too much of a trip to just run in real quick himself. And so we kind of sent messengers on ahead. 
And that's what we're going to look at tonight. Uh, if you're following along on the study sheet of the major events in the life of Paul by Brother Dal Flat, I've zoomed in again on the third Roman numeral here. That's the third missionary journey, hopefully making it clear that we're talking this journey is roughly 52 to 57 AD. And tonight we're at the end of this journey. So he's already spent three years in Ephesus at the beginning. And he's just making a quick stop here on his way back home to check in with the elders from Ephesus without going all the way to Ephesus. So let's pick up tonight with Acts 20, and we'll be looking at the first paragraph, verses 17 through 24. Acts 20, verses 17 through 24. From Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called to him the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, you yourselves know from the first day that I set foot in Asia, how I was with you the whole time, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials which came upon me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly and from house to house, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, bound by the Spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me. But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to solemnly testify of the gospel of the grace of God." Before we look at the whole passage, I want us to notice that from Miletus on the beach, Paul sends to Ephesus and he calls to him the elders of the church. So he calls the elders. And I know it's not in the passage that we just read. We'll get to it in just a, a more detail in just a moment. But if you skip down to verse 28, if you're able to look at that in your own Bible, I've put it here. Uh, you'll notice he addresses these elders that he calls for. And he refers to these men as overseers, and then he tells them to shepherd the church of God. And what I want us to notice is that these three terms refer to the same group of men. So notice here, he calls the elders of the church. It's the overseers who show up. And then he tells these men to shepherd the church of God. So I just want us to notice here that all three of these terms refer to the same office in the church or the same position. I know it's kind of weird to refer to it in that way, but I think that's the kind of the way we're thinking about that. The same office or position, the same group of men are addressed by those three terms. On the bottom half of the screen, uh, I'm showing the three Greek words that we have here uh, transliterated, I guess we might say, into English then with their English translations. Uh, the first word is the word Luke uses in verse 17 when he says that Paul calls the elders of the church to come meet him on the beach in Miletus. So, he doesn't refer to a specific age. He doesn't say anybody 65 and above or anything like that. This is not defined specifically in Scripture. Uh, but these men are simply older. They are older men. As I remember it, the Hebrew form of this word uh, ultimately refers to the chin. And uh, in other words, by looking at a man's chin, you can often tell whether he is older. In other words, uh, he has a white beard, and I think that was going back to some Old Testament times and some translations that were done back there. That's how they handled that particular uh, word. And so I guess the idea is from a long way off, uh, you can often look at a guy and you can say, yep, that's an old guy. And uh, you can tell by looking at his face. But uh, as it comes to us today in English, that word simply refers to those who are older. That's a very accurate translation, elders in the church, men who are older uh, than some others. Uh, the second word is most accurately translated into English as overseer. Overseer. And I've put that one on the screen here as well. And I think if you're able to see this, if you're uh, joining us and you're able to look at the, the live stream on YouTube, I think you might be able to recognize uh, the word scope in that Greek word. If you look at that carefully, you can kind of make out the word scope or at least a variation of it. So it's the idea of looking at something to oversee, to look over, to manage. And so quite literally, the elders are the overseers or the supervisors. Uh, with the word supervisor, we see it, don't we? Supervisor, vision being the idea of looking. So looking over the managers of the congregation. Some older translations will uh, sometimes translate this word as bishop. 
which is really just a Latinized version of this word. I guess it's it's accurate if we know the word's history. Uh, but today, what do we think of when we hear the word bishop? I know today a lot of times uh, the word bishop has come to mean something other than overseer. So we hear the word bishop today. I think a lot of times we might think of the Catholic tradition of the hierarchy. And so you got the the Pope and the Cardinals and the bishops. The bishops are over multiple congregations. I think we have a bishop for the Catholic churches, you know, the big diocese here in Madison in the area. So there's that one guy who holds that position. And then he's over a number of congregations. But uh, that is not found in the Bible, that sense of structure beyond the local congregation. And so I'm just saying when we see that bishop is a, a translation of this word that's usually translated overseer, we just need to be careful about that. We need to know the background of it. And if we see the word bishop in Scripture, realize uh, it's not a guy in charge of multiple congregations. It's just a, kind of an older translation, a Latinized version of this word that we would more accurately translate as overseer. And then we have that word that we would translate as shepherd. That would be the most uh, accurate, the, the simplest uh, English translation. This word goes back to the idea of feeding or caring for the flock. So certainly feeding is the main duty. you got to feed the sheep, but a, a lot kind of goes along with that. And like bishop, the Latinized version of this word is pastor. And technically, that would be an accurate translation of this word, but perhaps, again, somewhat misleading just because of the way this word is used in modern times. Uh, today, when most people use the word pastor, and if they say this person is a pastor of a church, what are they uh, thinking of? Uh, how are they using that word? Well, usually they're thinking of the minister or the preacher, and so that's the modern usage of this word. So I'm just pointing this out here so that we can be careful with it. The most accurate translation would really be uh, shepherd. Not that pastor is inaccurate. It's just a different uh, different translation, a different background into uh, kind of a different path that it took into the English language, although it goes back uh, to the same Greek word. But anyway, I just uh, show this to emphasize that these three words are used interchangeably in the Bible. And this is a rare passage where we have all three used together. And it makes this very clear that these three words are referring to the same group of men. It's not that the church has elders and then overseers and then shepherds, uh, but this is the same group. So uh, Paul calls the elders of the church together. It's the overseers who show up, and then he tells these men to shepherd the church of God. In the next few verses, Paul pretty much uh, connects with his audience. I think that'd be the best way of summarizing this. He he makes this personal. Um, I, I know a lot of times, especially if, uh, if I'm speaking at another congregation where we don't know each other too well, or maybe I know something of the town, or I know one of the families, if you understand, it, it, it's, uh, it's helpful to use something like that to build rapport or establish some sense of ethos with the congregation to try to um, uh, establish that bond at the beginning of the lesson. And that seems to be what he's doing here, connecting with the audience. Uh, he reminds these men of what he did when he was in Ephesus earlier on this journey. In verse 18, I think we would summarize that by saying he was focused on the mission. He knew why he was there, and so he got to work. He was serious about his work. Uh, in the second place, he put his heart into the work, doesn't he? Um, he? His heart was in it. He was all in. And in verse 19, he served with humility and uh, with uh, trials and tears and persecution. So it was difficult. Not that Paul was uh, like a weepy, always sad kind of person. He wasn't. You can't think that if you read the book of Philippians. It's a very uh, joyful book. Uh, but certainly there were times. It's serious work. And so um, he put his heart into it and he served with tears through trials and so on. And then finally, he focused on teaching and preaching the word of God publicly and from house to house. We see that in verses 20 and 21. And so he didn't hold back, but he taught what was needed. And he taught what needed to be taught, regardless of the consequences. He was fearless. Um, not that he wasn't scared from time to time, but he preached on maybe regardless of his fear might be a better way of putting that. So Paul was courageous in his preaching especially with reference to repentance and faith. And those are two categories where it's kind of uh, tempting to back off a little bit, especially when it comes to repentance. And you think, well, who am I to, to tell this person that they need to be doing or not doing that? And you, you kind of feel a little self-conscious there. But Paul, he plowed right into it. He had to say what had to be said. And so he plowed forward. So this is kind of his summary of his three years in Ephesus as he 
reintroduces himself to these elders on the beach there. In the next few verses, Paul gives a bit of a preview. He's heading back to Jerusalem. It doesn't look good for Paul personally. Uh, he's going. He's on his way. The Holy Spirit is sending him there. But the Holy Spirit also continues to warn that bonds and afflictions await him when he gets there. So you need to go, but it won't be good when you get there. This will not end well for you, basically. Uh, his conclusion, though, is that his life is nothing compared to the mission given to him by the Lord Jesus. As he wrote to the Philippians in Philippians 1.21, For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. To live is Christ and to die is gain. So, uh, if he lives, he gets to serve the Lord. If he dies, great. He gets to go and be with the Lord face to face in heaven. So his mission here is to solemnly testify of the gospel of the grace of God. So regardless of the consequences, uh, Paul is ready to go and he's done a lot of uh, hard work there in Ephesus. All right, let's continue with Acts 20 verses 25 through 31. Acts 20, 25 through 31. And now behold, I know that all of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will no longer see my face. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. In the first few verses here, Paul transitions from those opening comments uh, by way of introducing himself to these men again. And he transitions to the main point. So he spent time in Ephesus, working hard and preaching, all of that. And because of this, he's letting them know now that they will probably never see him again. And so this is what's going to happen. And because of this, yes, it's sad. But Paul reminds them that he did what he came there to do. He didn't hold anything back, which makes him innocent of the blood of all men. And that most likely is a reference back to Ezekiel 33, verses 7 through 9, where God says to the prophet Ezekiel, Now as for you, son of man, I have appointed you a watchman for the house of Israel. So you will hear a message from my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you shall surely die, and you do not speak up to warn the wicked from his way. That wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require from your hand. But if you on your part warn a wicked man to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, he will die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your life. And so in that picture then, I think Paul is taking on the role of watchman, and he takes that from the book of Ezekiel, the picture of a guard standing duty uh, at the city gate or up on one of the guard towers. His duty is to preach the word of God regardless of the cost to him personally. Kind of similar to Ezekiel's role there. When people are sinning, and if we give a warning, there's a sense in which God uh, will hold us accountable if we don't give the warning. But if we do give the warning and they don't listen, well, then that's on them. I hope that makes sense. But it seems to be a picture he's carrying over from the book of Ezekiel. And so in his message to the elders from Ephesus, Paul is saying, I did what I came there to do. I have fulfilled my mission by declaring to you the whole purpose of God. I think some of the older translations say the whole counsel of God. And that's a lot more familiar to me. I think I've heard that a lot more uh, than the whole purpose of God. But that's where that reference is. And this is a real challenge to preach the whole counsel or the whole purpose of God. How do you preach everything that a group of people need to know about God? That is the, the lifetime challenge of a gospel preacher. As we know, the Bible has more than 31,000 verses spread out over 1,189 chapters in 66 books written over a period of 1,500 years by 40 different men and it is impossible or nearly difficult extremely difficult to cover all of it and that's one reason why i try to ask for your help so often at least once a year and that door is always open by uh, asking for questions you may have or interesting passages or confusing passages or a favorite passage of scripture if you have anything that you think i'm missing in my preaching uh, I hope you'll let me know, because I only have maybe 47 sermons a year, 
and I could preach from here to the next hundred years, and there is no possible way that I could cover the whole Bible. And so I need your input as to what I'm missing and what we need to cover as a congregation. So uh, so let me know. So we need to have a balance between the old and the new. Uh, there are topics that we need to cover on a regular basis, basis like worship and baptism and singing and and that kind of thing, and their passages, and, and truly that is one of the most difficult parts of preaching, uh, deciding what needs to be covered in sermon form. But Paul, though, uh, declared the whole purpose of God. In three years, he covered all of it. So I don't know, uh, I guess that's the day-to-day, -day from house-to-house -house kind of thing. He was a very hard-working gospel preacher and uh, just an amazing accomplishment uh, there in the city of Ephesus. He now transitions over kind of to the so what part of this message, uh, this is what this means for you, specifically as the elders of this congregation. They are to be on guard. Notice they are to be on guard, first of all, for themselves, but then also for all the flock. So, first of all, the elders need to be on guard for themselves. And that reminds us, serving as an elder uh, isn't just about overseeing others. It's not just making decisions about other people, that kind of thing. It's not just about the whole church, but it's also about elders overseeing themselves. Uh, in our regular meetings, we have a, a time in our agenda where we, uh, I sometimes describe it as shepherds shepherding shepherds. Um, as shepherds, we need to check in with each other on a regular basis. So as shepherds, we're also sheep in the congregation. I think that's what Paul is suggesting here. You need to be on guard for yourselves, he says here at the beginning. But then also Paul says that elders are to be on guard for all the flock, so for all the sheep assigned to their care. And I guess here I would point out this is kind of one of the arguments for having a congregation of the Lord's people. As elders, we aren't responsible for all sheep all around the world. Um, you know, sheep at the church down in South Beloit or over in Milwaukee or up in Eau Claire somewhere, they're not my primary responsibility. If I know somebody and I can help, uh, great. But as elders of the Four Lakes congregation, we are responsible primarily for the members of our congregation. And so that's kind of one of the main arguments for uh, placing fellowship at a congregation. We want to identify with the church and say, yes, we're on the same team here. Uh, we're laboring together for the Lord, and I want to work with the elders of the congregation. That way the elders can get to know that person and are then responsible for um, overseeing that particular individual. Um, if we were together, I might ask, in what sense had the Holy Spirit made these men overseers? That's an interesting comment here at the beginning, um, among which this Holy Spirit has made you over. So how did the Holy Spirit make these men elders? And I think if we were to discuss this a little bit, I think we would probably conclude that the Holy Spirit makes men elders when the church uses the qualifications given in Scripture by the Holy Spirit. And so when the Spirit, through the Apostle Paul, says that elders must be the husband of one wife, and, and so on and so on, when the church uses those qualifications to say, yes, these men meet these qualifications, then I think in that sense, the Holy Spirit has made those men overseers of the congregation. So in that sense, the Spirit plays a key role in placing men in the role of shepherd overseer. At the end of verse 28, we come to the other description of the role. As Paul describes these men as shepherding the church of God, that is, which the, the church which the Lord purchased with his own blood. So, as we noted earlier, we have the elders that are called. They are described as overseeing the flock, and here they are told to shepherd the Lord's church. Again, these three terms are used interchangeably, elder, overseer, and shepherd. And as we noted this past Lord's Day from Revelation 5, Jesus ransomed us with his blood. And we see this again at the end of verse 28. He purchased us with his blood. The church is not our church. It is his church in that he purchased it. He owns it. He is the head of it. And the reason for all of this encouragement to be on guard actually comes in the form of a warning down in verse 29. So the reason for the encouragement is that Paul knows that after he leaves, savage wolves will come in among the congregation, not sparing the flock. And I find it interesting that nearly 2,000 years later, we are still having discussions about the damage that wolves can do to livestock, aren't we? Does that sound familiar to you here in Wisconsin? This week here in Wisconsin, a court canceled the upcoming wolf hunt. 
Does that sound familiar now? Now we're, it's been on the news the last few days here. So, you know, this week here in Wisconsin, we're talking about wolves harming flocks and, uh, and so on. So whatever we believe about that politically, I think we have to realize that wolves attack livestock. That is what wolves do. Um, it's their nature. They hunt. So they hunt deer. They also hunt sheep and they hunt cows and so on. This is what they do. And so in this passage, Paul warns that false teachers will do the same thing to members of the congregation that wolves will do to a flock of sheep. That is, they will come in and they will not spare the flock. They don't care about the flock. They have no feelings toward the sheep in any positive way. Uh, they will destroy the flock. And so that's the warning that Paul gives here. And what is especially shocking is what Paul points out in verse 30. These wolves, where will they come from? He says they will arise from among your own selves. In other words, the wolves will arise from within the eldership. So these people who will end up destroying the church are perhaps standing right there on the beach with the Apostle Paul and the others at that very moment. Personally, that reminds me of Judas. He was one of the 12, wasn't he? But he ended up doing tremendous damage, even though he was handpicked by the Lord Jesus himself. And in the same way, these elders, they really, in a sense, need to keep an eye on each other. As I said earlier, shepherds, shepherd, shepherds. We need to shepherd each other as elders because savage wolves will arise from within the eldership. That's Paul's warning to the elders from Ephesus. I would take this as a reminder that elders do not necessarily remain qualified to serve as elders forever. Uh, sometimes men change over time. I mean, obviously men do change over time, hopefully for the better. Hopefully we grow and get stronger and pray more and, and study more and get closer to the Lord. But obviously, sometimes elders will fall away or will become disqualified over time. And the church needs to deal with that and the elders need to deal with that. Uh, but they are to be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years, Paul did not cease from admonishing each member of the congregation with tears. So this was not just a job for Paul, was it? This wasn't something he just did for a living, kind of went to the office and, uh, you know, collected a paycheck or whatever. Uh, but it was a mission given to him by the Lord Jesus himself, and uh, he put his heart into it. All right, let's continue with Acts 20, verses 32 through 35. Acts 20, 32 through 35. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or clothes, you yourselves know that these hands ministered to my own needs and to the men who were with me. In everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner, you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, that he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. In verse 32, Paul lets these men know that the way they protect the flock is by keeping themselves in the word of his grace. So as Paul's leaving, uh, never to be seen again, but on his way out, he points these men back to the word of God. The word of his grace is able to build them up, that is, to make them stronger. The word of his grace will lead to an eternal inheritance. And so in Paul's absence, there won't, they won't have Paul there anymore to ask advice. They won't be able to call him up and bring him over and, and talk to him for a few hours and pick his brain over church issues. But uh, in, that, in the absence of Paul... Uh, he says they are to turn their attention to the inspired word of God. And if that was true of these men back there in 57, 58 AD, uh, I think we'd have to agree that that is especially true of us. The word of God can build us up. The word of God can give us an inheritance if we pay attention to it, if we use his word as a guide. Uh, starting in verse 33, Paul now shifts back to his own behavior in Ephesus again. And he uses himself as an example. What I find interesting is Paul could have just quoted a passage from the Bible. He could have just said, as Deuteronomy says, you are to do this. But I find it interesting he, he does it. He uses his own behavior as a pattern. And I know sometimes we'll, people will say, oh, the preacher talked too much about himself today. And I know there's a danger in that, but there's also a balance there. I think this fits in with what Paul wrote in several letters, actually, uh, at least three times. Uh, 1 Corinthians 4.17, for example, Paul wrote this, 
Therefore, I exhort you, be imitators of me. That's pretty straightforward. That's a bold statement, isn't it? To say to somebody, do what I do. That's almost a, a terrifying thing to say in a sense, and, and it is. In 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Paul writes, be imitators of me just as I also am of Christ. And so he qualified it there. Follow me as I follow Christ. So don't just follow me blindly, but keep an eye on the Lord, but kind of use me as a practical example insofar as I follow the Lord personally. And then over in Philippians 3.17, he writes, Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. So Paul's using his words here, uh, but he's also appealing to his own personal example. Uh, specifically, he refers to the fact that he did not covet anyone's silver or gold or clothing. And I'm thinking as the elders hear these words, they probably thought back to the three years Paul spent in Ephesus. And they were probably able to say, yeah, that's right. I, I remember that. Paul did not covet our stuff. He was content. Uh, he didn't go around always wanting more and more and more and demanding and so on. And in the same way, uh, Paul referred to working with his hands in order to make a living in Ephesus, to take that burden off the church. And again, the elders could remember this. It was just a year or so earlier, and the purpose for Paul's work was to demonstrate the importance of helping the weak. And that fits in with what Paul writes to Ephesus over in Ephesians 4.28, when he says, He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with one who has needs. So this is something we have uh, tried to teach our own children, I believe, through the years. The purpose for having a job, the purpose for making money, is to help other people. And so get a good job, work hard, enjoy that, do well at it, but always use that skill uh, to help the Lord in some way, to help other people in some way as we have the opportunity. So I think that's what Paul taught consistently, and we see it here again. Uh, here at the end, he ties it to Jesus. And I, just for the fun of it, or maybe I guess I should say to be consistent, I put that last little quote in red. Uh, some of our Bibles put the words of Christ in red, so I've done that here. Uh, usually we find the red print where? Uh, usually Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But we do have a few times here and there outside the Gospel accounts spread throughout the New Testament with a statement here or there. And this is one of those occasions where we find red ink somewhere other than the four Gospel accounts. And, um, and what I find unique here is that Paul is not quoting from the four gospel accounts. So it doesn't say, as Mark says, or as John says, and, and this statement is not found in those four gospel accounts. And so this statement is only found here. And so apparently Paul perhaps heard this from Jesus directly. Uh, either that or it was a common statement passed down from others. So it is more blessed to give than to receive. And again, it's not found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, only here. Um, I would love to preach on this little beatitude. It's a blessing, more blessed to give than to receive. I would love to preach on that beatitude at some point. Um, but uh, I think most of us know this to be true from personal experience. Generally speaking, it is better to be on the giving end of some kind of help than to be on the receiving end. Uh, when we give to another person, when we help like that in some way, we benefit, don't we? There are benefits to giving. We feel good. It's good for our mental health, and it's just good for us in general. It's good for our relationship with the Lord. Uh, but something else that I notice here is this. There is some benefit to receiving, isn't there? It is more blessed to give than to receive. And so, as I see this, the way Paul remembers this quote, the way he words it here, there must be some benefit to receiving. So I would encourage this, uh, I would encourage us to take this as a reminder, if we need help, and if others are willing to help us, uh, let's allow them the blessing of helping. And I don't know if we've ever thought about it in that way. I know it's very tempting to say, when somebody offers to help, oh, no, I'm okay. You don't need to bother with helping me or whatever. Have you, have you said that? I know I've said that. And, um, you know, when I really probably could have used the help, it's, it's very easy to say, oh, no, no, don't, you know, don't drop off a meal. Don't worry about that. Nothing. I don't, I don't need a thing or whatever. But if we need the help, let's allow our Christian family 
the blessing or the benefit of giving. If it's more blessed to give than to receive, uh, somebody's got to be a receiver, okay? And it's great to give, but uh, we also need to receive when it's our time to receive. If we need the help, um, there's certainly no shame in receiving the help that is needed. So I know, again, we often focus on the giving part of this passage, and I understand why, because that's where the emphasis is. Uh, but giving would be impossible without somebody being willing to receive. All right, let's conclude tonight with the last little paragraph here, Acts 20, verses 36 through 38. Acts 20, 36 through 38. When he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them, and they began to weep aloud and embraced Paul and repeatedly kissed him, grieving especially over the word which he had spoken, that they would not see his face again. And they were accompanying him to the ship. After encouraging and warning the elders, Paul kneels down. Um, then he prays with these men. They kneel together on the beach. And then after they pray together, these men weep. They hug. They kiss Paul repeatedly. They're torn up over his comment that he would not that they would not see their face again. And uh, they'll go with him to the ship. And then Paul heads out, as we'll see next week as we head into chapter 31. Uh, kind of the question for me here at the end is, did these men listen to what Paul said here? Did they listen? How did this go? Did they take this advice? Remember, this takes place in the late 50s AD. Roughly 40 years later, Jesus sends a special message to the church there in Ephesus. And that message is found in Revelation 2, verses 1 through 7. So I want us to just fast forward 40 years or so and notice the condition this church is in 40 years later. Revelation 2, 1 through 7. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, says this, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance and that you cannot tolerate evil men. And you put to the test those who call themselves apostles and they are not. And you found them to be false. And you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. But I have this against you that you have left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first, or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Yet this you do have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So looking back on this, did the elders in Ephesus pay attention? Did they listen to Paul's warning here? Well, in some ways, yes. Isn't that correct? Even 40 years later, they did not tolerate evil men. Isn't that what Paul warned them about on the beach there? Uh, they hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. However, in the process of sorting out false teachers and looking for wolves among them, which they did a good job of doing, in the process of doing that, Jesus says that they had also left their first love. So they were protecting the church from false teachers, which was an absolutely necessary thing to do. However, they fell out of love with the Lord Jesus through the years, and Jesus has to tell them to repent. So obviously the eldership itself had almost certainly rotated and turned over. These are, <laughs> I'm thinking, probably not the same men 40 years later, especially 2,000 years ago with the lifespans that they had back then. Um, and so that eldership had perhaps turned over several times to new and different men. Uh, but we do have this rather disturbing update roughly 40 years later. There is some good that could be said, uh, but certainly they face some challenges as well. Uh, this is a, a good place for us to take a break tonight. Paul is making his way back to Jerusalem. Again, he's in a hurry, delivering famine relief from the Gentile congregations. He's encouraging as many as he can along the way, including the elders from Ephesus on the beach there in Miletus. Next week, Paul will continue on his way back home to Jerusalem, and he'll make it there partway through chapter 21. So I hope you can join us next week for that. Uh, again, thank you for taking the time to study with us tonight. I hope you can be together for worship this Sunday at 9 or 11, and uh, plan on joining us for class in between at 10. A good time of fellowship, a good time to learn and be together. And let me know if you have something that we need to be praying about. Uh, let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you for telling us about the Apostle Paul and his travels. Uh, tonight, we're very thankful for his encouraging words to the elders from Ephesus. 
We're thankful for our shepherds here in Madison, and we pray for our current and all future elders here in Madison, that they will take these words to heart, guarding and feeding the flock, paying careful attention to your word. Thank you, Father, for being with us through this difficult time, through the pandemic. We're, we're thankful for the blessing of giving. It truly is more blessed to give than it is to receive. And so we're thankful for the resources that you've given to us. We're thankful for ways we've been able to help as individuals and as a congregation. And we pray for wisdom as we reach out and help others in various ways. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.